Welcome back, everyone. It's good to have you here. So it is Sunday morning, and I am in my gear shed, which is located next to my house out near the Cascades in northern Washington state. And we got about eight inches of snow last night, and it's still coming down. So I'm getting all packed up to go out and do some shooting. But before I do, I wanted to answer some of your questions from this past week. And then I also wanted to discuss goal setting for landscape and outdoor photography and anything creative and why I think goals are a really bad way to go about getting things accomplished creatively and show you the technique that I use instead of goals. So first thing we'll do is we'll go into the questions that you guys had and if you're a subscriber to my channel you can ask questions and then I'll pick some of the top voted ones and I will be answering them every week that I'm home. So if you're not a subscriber make sure to hit the subscribe button and then hit the bell next to it too, and then you'll get a little notification at the top of your screen when I post new videos. And another great way to help my channel out is to hit the thumbs up or like button below the video. And if you'd like to get a bunch of extra free photography tips and my shooting PDF guides and a bunch of other stuff, you can check out my email list. And you can unsubscribe anytime. I don't spam you guys. I just send you out really good stuff that I feel will be helpful for your landscape and outdoor photography. So let's get into the questions here, and then I'll talk about goal setting and the failures of goal setting, and then we'll answer some more questions. So hopefully you guys like this style of video. Make sure to let me know in the comments. All right, so the first question is from Larry Manasia. I think that's how you pronounce it, Larry. It says, did you ever consider leading groups on backcountry photography trips? I would definitely love to visit some of these places, but would likely never go at it alone. The areas in these two videos seem like a landscape photography's paradise. Photographer's paradise. Well, thanks for the question, Larry. So, the videos that he's talking about are my hiking slash backpacking silent films that I've been putting out. So you guys can check out those there. The last video I put out and about four back now. And they link together. As far as taking groups out on backcountry trips, I have definitely considered it, Larry. But there are also some big factors at play and reasons why I have not done that yet. The number one factor is that I'm only able to take out people that have previous backpacking experience and that also have very good endurance and physical abilities. And there might be a lot of you out there that would like to go on these trips that have both of those pre-requirements. The problem is, and why I don't take beginner groups out into the field is because there are tons of beginner backpacking workshops that you can take to learn how to set up your tent. You can learn to do the basics of everything that goes into backpacking. But the kind of trips that I like to do are usually very grueling in terms of the weather that I come in contact with because most people when they learn to go backpacking learn to go out under clear skies and really good weather conditions. But for landscape photography, those conditions are not conducive of good photos. You want really nasty weather systems rolling through you want storms rolling through and you want to kind of catch the transition from the good weather to the bad weather. And that's when you get really good light because the horizon will be open, but then there'll be clouds rolling in over you, maybe snow, rain, everything else. And then that light coming off the horizon will hit all that weather and light it up and you get really good light. So the problem is, is that when you see backpacking on a film, and I'm not sure this is you, Larry, it could be anybody. You might have previous experience and I don't know, but a lot of people before they get into backpacking and wilderness photography think that it's going to be enjoyable all the time. And really deep down, I always find it enjoyable, but there are portions of the trip every single day where you're like, why am I out here doing this? You might be cold, your hands and feet are numb, your face is numb, your legs are just dead tired from hiking all day. And the ability to block that out and still have a good time definitely takes a good bit of practice. And that's why I like to pair these trips with people that would also be very high level or even intermediate level at endurance training. Because endurance training, meaning running long distances and hiking long distances, even if it's just for a day, teaches you the exact same skill set of not listening to your mind and all the different things that might be going on that don't feel that great in the current moment. So I've definitely considered it. What I'll do is... I'll have you guys, if you guys are interested in this kind of workshop, or it wouldn't even be a workshop, it'd basically be you guys following me out on a legitimate trip, and I would take two to three people maximum. You'd have to already understand backpacking. I have a full backpacking course that's part of my online school that I would give you to start with. 
I'd give you a training schedule. I'd say in three months, you need to be ready for this trip if you want to go. And my goal would be to show people what wilderness photography is actually like. So it wouldn't be the kind of thing where you're just going to have the perfect shot set up for you, the perfect environment set up for you. You would just be following me out on a trip. We're going to find the shots. We're going to find the locations. We're going to camp. We're going to hike off trail. And I can't guarantee good shots come out of this because 99.9% .9 of the time, I don't get good shots. But it's that 0.1% of the time that I do that it's all worth it. But if you guys are interested in this kind of trip, and you've done backpacking before, you have like intermediate level experience and your fitness level is pretty good. Meaning you can go out and do a 10 mile day hike with a pack on for a few days in a row. Um, ideally 15 mile with a pack on. But if you couldn't do 10 miles, then I wouldn't consider it something that you would be ready for yet. It's something you can definitely work your way into. But if you are interested in this kind of trip, leave me a comment below the video, anybody. And I'll see how many comments I get. And from that, I can determine if it's something I'll look at doing in the future. Um, I do have all the certifications such as wilderness first responder and everything that is required to take people out on these. So it's something that's definitely possible, but you guys let me know in the comments if it's something you're interested in. Uh, the next question from David Benitez it says, Dave, how often do you clean your camera and what products do you recommend? Uh, the only time I clean my camera is I just wipe it off with like a cloth. You know, there's like computer screen cloths you can also use them on camera lenses. I carry three of those in my camera bag and they're all in separate Ziplocs. So once one starts to get dirty, I'll just put it uh, out of use for the trip. So I keep those and after the camera gets wet during the day, I have one of those for the camera body. I just wipe down the camera body and then I have one of those for the lens and I'll wipe down the lens. I don't use any special products. You can just go on the internet and get some of these little tech wipes or lens wipes. I normally carry ones that are about that big-ish. And that's all I use. I don't use anything else. I will take the camera in to get the sensor professionally cleaned because if you get it professionally cleaned, they use, an elect or they use a microscope and they put the sensor in the microscope so they can really see the tiny particulates that I can't see with just using the at-home sensor wipes. And I don't feel like dealing with it. I'd rather just pay a professional to keep his business going and have him do something he's an expert at, such as cleaning my camera sensor. And it's like 70 bucks. So it's a good way to support local businesses and have them do that. But other than that, I don't do anything. I don't think you need any special products. You don't need all these blowy things that you can clean your sensor off with. Just watch out how you change your lenses. So when you're changing lenses, if the wind's blowing at you, put your back to the wind and change your camera and the lens when your back's between you and the wind. And that'll keep any dust from flying in there. Just try to stay out of places when you're changing your lens that the dust could blow in and get it dirty. Other than that, I don't do anything. So this next question, get a cup, of, drink your coffee first here. Next question, it says, this is from uh, Elia Rech Rechman. I think that's how you say it. I always try to get these names right, but if I don't, sorry guys. It says, beautiful video, Dave. I have a hiking related question about your photography journey in nature. A thought I observed crossing my mind many times when hiking. Imagine you set a goal for the day to get to a point you scouted on a map. Your trip is planned and the food is rationed. While, you, while getting there, you pass through many gorgeous spots that catch your eye as potential landscape images. If only you were there to cut your day short, you could stay there, waiting for good lighting, conditions, and composition. So what he's basically getting at here is a lot of times when you go backpacking, you have this trip planned out and you have a time frame for your trip and you hike through an area you wish you could stay at, but you have a trip planned out and you have to get to this camp spot. So I would recommend, I know I know where you're coming from. I know the feeling a lot because I used to do this a lot. Um, I don't do backpacking trips like that anymore. So when I design a backpacking trip, I first study topographic maps. And on that topographic map, I will make a somewhat of a trail. So like I'll make a route that I want to do on that topo map and it might be 90, 100 miles, it might be 60 miles, whatever it is. And then I will pinpoint with some GPS tags, some locations that might be cool to shoot. I never designate where I'm going to camp and I never designate that I actually have to stay on this route. So I kind of study in the area. I study the other trails I could take. Sometimes I take off trail routes and then I always carry two days extra of food. And then I also know that I can go two days without eating, no problem, because just do fasting sometime. If you do a five-day fast 
and you continue to work out and run during that fast, then you'll have no problem understanding that you have plenty of energy even without food, so long as you've done it before and you know the feeling. So I know that I can extend my trip if I have eight days of food up to 10 days. So I usually just carry eight to 10 days of food that ensures that I can extend the trip to 12 days if I wanted to. And then I'll follow this route, but if I see a cool area along the route, I'll just stay there. I'll find a camp in the location and I'm never doing trips that are in designated camping spot areas. So a lot of national parks will make you sign up for like a quota of you have to stay in this spot this night and then you have to go to this spot this second night. If that exists, I'm just not going to that location because that sounds more like a tour of motelling. And there's nothing wrong with that if you like a tour of motelling, but I just don't like that style. I like to be purely free where I can get up and determine what I do every day. And if I have to determine before the trip where I camp at, that just turns me off of that trip completely. So I usually just go to designated wilderness areas. And in 99.9% .9 of those, you can pick your own camp. There are some rules, like you need to stay on a surface that can't be damaged. I mean, you don't stay out in a field with a bunch of grass that if you camp on it, it'll kill the grass. You stay on like some hard pack rock, you stay on some soil with nothing living on it, you stay on some any, anything that is non-destructive, meaning nothing's growing there, nothing's organic there that you're gonna kill. Or you can stay on the forest floor where there's just so much growing, like in the rainforest up in the Pacific Northwest. If there's nobody out in these areas, not close to the trailhead, but once you're 20 miles out in the rainforest, you can camp anywhere and it's gonna grow back over it. And that's just something you get used to over time. But I just design trips that don't ever require me to have an actual set schedule because I like to be on a schedule at home because it forces me to get work done and it holds me accountable. But when I'm out creating in the field and backpacking, I want to have pure freedom and I want to allow the best images to come out of that trip. And for the best images to come out of that trip, I always have to be able to change my plan, meaning I shouldn't have a plan to begin with. I have a GPS map, I know the area, I have trails of all the maps or maps of all the trails in the area. I have the maps on my phone so I can change things. I can go off trail, I have some places scouted. So that's kind of how I go about doing trips. And I just never feel guilty about it if I stop and stay at a place for a few days because if I don't get to another place later on my trip, then I still have that place in my mind and I'll just come back and hit it later. So I guess this is the main difference between doing landscape photography full time and working full time and doing landscape photography on the side. Both are fine, I've done both. I'm not putting anybody down that's working full time and doing landscape photography, that's your choice. Different people's lives match up in different ways. Um, but the problem with working full time and doing landscape photography one of the downsides is that you have probably have to plan a vacation every year around a specific week and you can't time the weather. So you kind of have to have this predestined trip going on because you have a time schedule and you can't really judge the weather. So what I will do when I want to go into a place and photograph it, I will say, well, let's say I want to go to this place within a specific range of months. Maybe it's like September, October, three or four weeks leading up to that trip. I'll start watching the weather in that location every day to get the weather patterns down. And once I get them down, I'll start watching the weather move in and out of that area. And when I see the perfect stretch of weather, meaning it's gonna go from decent weather to stormy weather to decent weather to stormy weather, meaning like undulating weather patterns, that's when the photography is gonna be good. So that's when I start driving to that area. And then if I need to, I'll camp out near the trailhead of my rig for a few days and really wait for the weather alignment to be perfect and then I'll head out. So oftentimes when I leave to do a 10 day backpacking trip, I'll often be gone for 15 days because I'm gonna drive there and then I'm gonna wait till the weather hits perfectly. And then I'm gonna go out and it might not be a 10 day backpacking trip. I might extend it to 12 or 13 or whatever else I feel like by cutting down on the food I'm using during that trip. So I have enough body weight on me. I can lose some weight, it's all good. Um, and I'm always ready to not eat all my food or have no food at the end of the trip if I need it. So hopefully that helps to answer your question. These are just things that I've learned over time while trying to get the best photos and set up the right systems to get those photos. But that was a really good question because I know exactly where you're coming from. All right, here's the next question. And after this question, I will talk about goals and why I think they are bad 
for getting things done and something you can use instead of goals. All right, so here's another question. Unfortunately, I didn't take the screenshot of this person's name, so sorry about that. The question is, do you feel that the stillness or emptiness of your time outdoors actually liberates creative thinking? Here's my hypothesis. Your analytical mind plans the trip, procures the supplies and delivers you and your camera to the start of the point, to the start point. But then your mind is free to enjoy and react to your surroundings. The mind is able to play when the mind is able to play, creativity begins. Thoughts. Um, well, this is actually going to play into my goals talk here in a little bit. I semi-agree with you, and I semi-don't agree with this uh, hypothesis. So what she's saying is basically that when you have all this free time to think because you're out on a backpacking trip in the wilderness, it allows you to be more creative because you're not having all these things come into your mind that could distract you or sidetrack you such as you would when you're back in the real world or civilization. Um, so I think there's a big myth or misconception that as an artist, you just need all this free time and then creativity will just spark out of it. I've tried that method and it fails miserably because what it allows you to do is it allows you to remove accountability for getting things done that are creative and that progress your work forward. Because when you say to yourself constantly, well, I just need some more free time and then this creative moment will happen and I'll create awesome work. Well, what I find to happen there is that this idea that this creative moment will just happen and that should be what inspires your work will cause you to never get any work done. And by never doing any work, you will never progress as fast as you could if you were constantly working, even when you didn't feel like it and forcing yourself to fail and getting feedback into the system of what works and what doesn't. So I think it's great to have free time to think. I have blocks in my calendar where I take long walks every night or long runs, meaning runs that are 10 to 12 miles plus or walks that are the same distance at least once a day because that frees up my mind to think on things that I've been working on all day. So usually I'll do these walks or runs after the workday and it lets me to kind of think through and I guess you could say process what I was working on during that day. So I think freedom to think and have a clear mind is great where you're not checking your phone, you're not checking the computer. And this is kind of the same aspect that you get when you're out backpacking because you can't check your phone, you can't check your computer. So I think it can bring some really nice freedom to your mind. But I think you can also get that same thing by having things that you want to get done. So when I go out on a backpacking trip, I have ideas for all the videos that I want to film. I film a whole lot of videos for my landscape photography school membership because I upload six to eight new videos onto that platform every month. And I get those done and I really enjoy doing this stuff. But if I just waited for creativity to strike and didn't have that stuff set up beforehand, I would never think of those videos and then just start them and complete them on a whim while out in the field. So I need some structure to be able to do that, but I also need freedom to think. So I think it's very good to have a system in place where you have structure and that forces you to be creative, even if you don't feel like it. So this creative muse isn't just gonna visit you and you're not just going to be, I guess, what's a good way to put it? It's not just going to come to you and make you create great stuff. Great stuff's gonna come out of you just putting in the work. So as far as the rest of this question, the, it says the mind is free to enjoy and react to your surroundings. So. I agree with that part completely. A lot of times being out in nature and being away from all the noise of society, you will come across different feelings that you wouldn't have when your mind is just garbled up with a bunch of junk and noise when you're back in society. And I think that's essential. And it's also essential for really spending all of your time getting specific things done. So when I have these different things I wanna get done on a trip, like make photos or videos, I don't have any distractions. So when I go out on an eight day trip and I'm backpacking, I'm prolific as far as getting work done. I fall asleep just after the sun goes down. I wake up two hours before the sun comes up and I'm just moving, hiking, creating content, creating videos, creating photos the entire day. And then eating and sitting and just enjoying the outdoors. So it's great for that, but I don't want anybody to get tricked to think that you get places and you become a better and better and more prolific creator from having freedom in your mind to wait for the work to come.
I think you need free time to think, process ideas, but I think you can put a system in place in your life that will ensure you have that free time to think, but the system always needs to ensure you also are working towards things that you want to get done in the long term. So hopefully that helps to answer your question. It's something that I definitely used to believe that some people were creative and some people weren't, and that's just what it is, but you can force yourself to be creative. And I basically learned this in aerospace engineering school because engineering is a very, very creative thing. People think, well, you just learn physics and you learn mechanics and all this stuff and you just become an engineer. Well, the best engineers are people like Elon Musk who have these visions in their mind that take maximum creativity and they see things and ways of doing things that nobody else has seen. So this is the definition of creativity, right? You're creating something that doesn't exist yet. But he's also an engineer, so he understands that you need to design systems that transport you from where you are to this creative idea that you make in your mind. So systems with big blank spaces to think, following through that system to what you're trying to get to, that is, in my definition, the perfect design of a creative life that you can live. All right, so let's go down here to what I wanted to talk about today. So I wanted to talk about why I think goals are a really bad way to get things done in your life and why I think instead of having goals, you need systems that will help you every day to transport you to where you want to go. So let's think about this. I'll draw it out for you so it kind of makes sense. And then if my brain's not fried after this talk, I'll answer a few more questions that we have. Can't promise on that though. So. Let me get a cup of coffee here and a Sharpie and we'll go through this stuff. I find drawing stuff like this to be very helpful. <clears throat> so let's first go with you. I'm gonna write you and I'll show you guys this here in a second. All right, so let's say you have you down here. And this is you sitting there and thinking, let's say it's the new year or something. People like to set a goal at the new year. I actually like to say um, things that I want to do every new year too for the following year, but I don't use goals to do it. I do what you're about to show you. So a lot of people would sit here and they'd be like, all right, it's the new year. I want to get in shape. I want to run a hundred miles. I want to go on a backpacking trip for five days. I want to make my photography better. You could come up with any of these goals. Let's say your goal is get better at photography. So I'll just write better photos. And my writing's terrible, so you'll just have to deal with it. So let's say you're down here brainstorming, and you're like, oh man, I want better photos. Well, a lot of people would just have that as their goal, and then they would just maybe look at it once a week, or they would do something else, like hold it in their mind and be like, man, I'm gonna do better photos this year, I'm gonna get better at photography. And then that's where the end of that thought process would stop. So having a goal such as better photos is a really bad way to get things done. And the reason it's bad is because you're sitting down here and you're gonna have to make this jump. Let's say this is, let's say you're up on the top of a building. This is story number five of the building. And this is story number six. And there's like 15 feet of vertical right here. And you've never jumped this far before. So you jump from here and you hope to grab on the edge and pull yourself up to the next story up. You might make it, you might grab on that ledge and pull yourself up, but a lot of times you're gonna miss it and fall way back down further than you were before. So what you really need is a stepping ladder that takes you from where you are and through small increments and steps that are easy to bite off and visualize, you can slowly step up to where you want to go. This stepping ladder is a system. And the only reason I have systems thinking embedded in my mind is because when you learn engineering, as far as when I learned engineering, they teach you systems thinking for everything. You want to design a system that's very good and you want to optimize that system. And once you've optimized it and made it as good as it needs to be, then you just let the system run and that will transport you just by following the system to where you want to go. So you don't have to worry about these goals. You have to just worry about taking the small steps every day that transport you to where you want to go. So whenever I envision something like 
better photos. This is how I would go about it. Let's say it's me down here and then I want better photos. I like to call this outcome thinking. So I have me down here, then I have the outcome of what I want. So the first thing I need to define is why I want better photos. Well, let's make sure we have enough time here. Yeah, we have plenty of time. The first thing I need to define is why I want better photos. And when I define the why, I need to be able to feel this viscerally in my entire body and it better really excite me. Because if it doesn't really excite me and I'm not saying hell yeah, I'm just gonna say no. So I got this hell yeah mentality from a guy named Derek Sivers. You can read his book, it's called Anything You Want. His mentality is I either say hell yeah or no. If it's not a hell yeah, I'm not doing it because I won't have the long-term motivation to do it. So first off, I need to know that I have a hell yeah here. And how do I get to know that? Well, why do I want better photos? Do I want better photos because I wanna share it with my friends and family and give them excitement from seeing my photos? Do I want better photos so I can challenge myself and learn and explore and travel to new places? Do I want better photos so I can become a pro landscape photographer and quit my job? These are all just brainstorming ideas I'm given, right? These are just the possible outcomes. Or maybe I want better photos because I wanna share them on Instagram and get a bunch of likes and mentally compete with other photographers. These are all things that people could want. So when you're looking for an outcome, define why you want that outcome. So let's just say for me, it was because I wanted to challenge myself and I wanted to be a pro landscape photographer so I could quit my job and work for myself. Well, when I think about that scenario, it still makes me say, hell yeah, I still get excited and I can feel it in my body, I actually start getting excited right now talking about it. So if you can have that visceral feeling of excitement when you're having this outcome thinking and asking yourself why, that should be the first step. And the goal is to be able to bring up this visceral feeling anytime you think of where you're trying to go for this specific thing. So that's the whole why. Now we need the how to get there. We need to design the system that we will follow to get from here to that feeling or that thing we're aiming for in the future. So if you think about this, how do you actually get better photos? Well, I know that there's one way that's gonna work. That is to constantly edit photos and they're gonna be horrible at first, but through repetition, through failure, through constantly doing it, you're gonna put out a whole body of work of photos. Most of them at first are gonna be bad. And then over time, as you continue to put out photos, a more and more better percentage of those are gonna get good, and then they're gonna get better, and they're gonna be really good. But the only way to do that is constant repetition. So the system for this would be so many days a week, for so and so time, you edit photos no matter what. For myself, I set five days a week, one hour a day, I edit photos. Now, it's key here that you set this up so it's a very short amount of time that you know you can accomplish every day. And once you get that down, you can always go beyond that amount of time. So Monday morning rolls around. I do this every morning early, so I can't fail at it. I get up, I go to my computer with a coffee, and I said, let's get the hour done. I start to edit photos. Some days I go for more than an hour because I'm excited, I'm in the flow, I'm getting some good results. Other days, I'm just not motivated. And I'm like, dude, an hour's enough, I'm done for the day. It's just not the day, but I got my hour done. So one hour, five X week, one hour, five X per week. And you can set this schedule anything you want. You can make it a half an hour. You could make it seven days a week, whatever you want. Here's the system. One hour, five days a week, get up and do it. Never have to think. A system takes all the thinking out of the whole creative process and allows you to create and it makes you accountable. So when I'm doing this every day, I'm always accountable. I'm not waiting for some creative muse to come visit me. I'm saying, I'm gonna sit down at work and I know that the photos will get better by sitting down to do the work because I'm gonna fail a lot. I'm gonna get input back into my creative system and I'm gonna be able to create more photos the next time and slowly I'll get to better photos, but only through this repetitive system. Every week, I'm gonna edit. I'm gonna crank out more photos no matter what. And I don't need to have a goal up here. 
because when you have a goal and you feel like your photos aren't getting better and you just have this long-term goal, what happens is you feel like a failure. But if you have a system in place, such as this, every time you complete one hour of work every morning, even if the work is bad, you feel like you've accomplished something. So every day you have these small micro accomplishments and these over time build up to make you have better photos. And even if you had this goal of getting better photos within a year, and let's say in your mind you didn't reach it. Well, if you have a system and you edited for five days a week, for an hour a day, that's five hours a week. So throughout the whole year, you get 50 weeks times five. Will that be 250 hours of photo editing that you got done during that year? So there's a guarantee at the end of that year, 250 hours of photo editing, your photos will definitely be better. There's no question about it. I will guarantee you that. But if you just have this so-called goal in your mind of better photos, and you go through the year and edit sometimes and don't sometimes, you have this open loop in the back of your head that says, what should I be doing to get better photos? Well, maybe I'll try this today. Maybe I'll try this today. But you don't have a system to depend on. And without the system to depend on, you might get to your goal once in a while, but most of the time you're gonna fail, feel like crap about yourself, and things just aren't gonna work out. So everything I wanna do, I design systems for. Now, some systems are short-term, meaning let's say you wanna learn a new skill set, but you don't wanna be a world-class expert. So let's just say you want to learn some stuff about backpacking so you can go out on a three-day trip. Well, you could have a system in place that said, well, first I need to learn this this week, then I need to learn this this week, then I need to learn this this week. Having a schedule will get you there. So maybe that's a three-month project you have and it has a system. Then you could have some long-term systems for things like being a pro landscape photographer. Maybe you want to be an expert at the outdoors and backpacking. These could be things that you're gonna work on for 10 plus years, but they can also have systems in place so you're not constantly wondering what should I do next, but you're setting up the system that will transport you to where you wanna go and you have the why in place. So you have that visceral feeling that makes you excited every time you think about where you're going. And then so long as you're following that system every week, you're getting these small micro accomplishments and you're not just waiting for this goal that's gonna make you feel great. You're constantly learning and improving and even if you fail in the long term, you'll learn all this stuff on the way that will allow you to make better decisions on where you might actually want to go. Because what I've noticed is when I used to make goals in the past, I would have this vision of this goal. And then I would just sometimes wait for it to happen. Sometimes I would make decisions that would help me to make the thing happen. But I wouldn't be constantly learning or constantly failing. So I couldn't really direct myself in the way that I wanted to go. But when you use a system and you're constantly refining your ideas and pushing yourself on a schedule and trying to get better, then a lot of times where you thought you wanted to go in the first place, that will shift a little bit, maybe 10% to the right or left, and that will take you in some other direction. And you would have never been able to see that thing if you would have just stayed where you were, hoping for this massive goal out on the horizon. So I really think systems thinking versus having goals is the way to go for creators. Just don't get tricked into thinking that this creative muse will arrive on your doorstep and make you great at art or photography. And I'm not even close to where I wanna go. I'm always trying to improve. I still think my work's crappy, but I think it's better than it used to be. And I think that for everything that I know, I know that I have a lot of stuff to learn for all different parts of my life, but it's about choosing the things that make you say, hell yeah, about saying no to everything else and going from there. So that was, another 15 minutes. So I don't think I'm going to do any more questions today, but I'll leave you guys with that. Make sure to leave a thumbs up under this video, hit the subscribe button and the bell next to it so you can get this coming week's videos. And if you'd like to sign up for my email list, you can find a link below this video. And I send out a bunch of cool stuff to my email list that you can't get anywhere else on my website. It includes PDFs with shooting techniques that you can download, take out in the field with you and a bunch of other good stuff that'll really help you out. So thanks for watching, guys. I always appreciate you being here, and thanks for the support. See you guys next week. Bye.